Hi, I'm Tyler, and this is the Fox Valley Film Critics. In this episode of the show, we're going to be discussing the next in the lineup of the AFI's Top 100 American Movies, Unforgiven, as well as the newest James Mangold movie, Ford v. Ferrari. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to the show brought to you by Group Think Productions and FBTV. Joining us once again is Dad. Hi! <laughs> and or Darren. You know, you want to... <laughs> I'm good with either. I'll, I'll, to you, I'll answer for both. Uh, to, to both, rather. So. so tell me, Father Unit, how do we... What are your thoughts on Unforgiven? Wow! Um, one of the things that, that comes out in the film is that uh, Clint Eastwood uh, character really takes a turn when he starts drinking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll you don't you don't quite get a feel for him. You know, there's something there. Uh, so he is introduced and in unforgiven as a father of two. He's living by himself. He is a widower. Uh, he's raising the two children from that marriage. And uh, as we get to know him, it there appears there's something under the surface. There's something that we uh, would learn about him in his past, that he, is, uh, he, he was once upon a time a very, very bad, bad man. Yes. And so, uh, you know, not to go too far into the woods or, or into the spoilers, but it's, it's been out for 20-some years now, so, you know, uh, pick up a DVD and watch it. Uh, the, uh, the story starts with uh, uh, a woman prostitute that uh, just gets beaten and her face slashed due to a, a, a incident that went horribly wrong uh, while she was performing, shall we say, uh, the duties of her job. And uh, because of that, the other, uh, her co-workers decided to uh, band together and pool funds and uh, ultimately were looking to uh, hire somebody to kill the guy that slashed her uh, because the uh, the sheriff in town, Gene Hackman, who was absolutely amazing and I believe won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, uh, uh, nah, we're, uh, we're good here and uh, uh, she's got you know there's going to be compensation involved and you'll get that and so and so we're good and they just said that wasn't good enough so that's how word of that bounty, if you will, reaches its way uh, throughout the West, and uh, uh, Clint Eastwood is being uh, asked, would you like to go get that money? And thus the plot ensues. And he ends up teaming up with a, uh, a young bounty hunter who doesn't know what the heck he's doing. And Morgan Freeman. And Morgan Freeman. <clears throat> who is in the midst of uh, really his uh, you know, career renaissance in that period. Just a couple of years before he had done Glory, uh, he was on the way to doing uh, Seven and you know, the whole host of movies that, uh, that truly defined him as, uh, as an amazing actor. Bruce Almighty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I mean for me this is probably my top tier of Eastwood. I mean, okay. I, I, mean, I mean it's kind of hard to gauge that because Eastwood is so qualitatively all over the place. And yeah. Then, you go, you go from Firefox to this. I mean, I mean, there, he doesn't seem to have any sort of consistency to his work, as I mean, as, some, as some of his recent films have shown, like with we, Changeling and okay. Jersey Boys. So essentially, what you're saying is that he's yeah, he, he never limits himself. He that never doesn't... limits himself, and occasionally he doesn't seem to pick projects that play to his strengths. So true, like Jersey Boys. <laughs> Yes, uh, you would think that uh, you know, for someone whose directorial, uh, shall we say, directorial method is, um, uh, we'll do a couple takes. I'm sure it's good. 
<laughs> and we'll put it together. It strikes me of a man who really puts a lot of thought into his movies, but it, right. But I mean, it's just rep by reputation doesn't doesn't do or doesn't expect a lot of takes from his actors. He expects them to be ready to go and figures their first uh, run throughs are going to be uh, the ones that are going to be the keepers, and, and that's how he does it, and it, it works. Yeah, I mean, here is definitely his is kind of the top because obviously his whole career has kind of existed in the uh, the shadow of the Dollars trilogy. Yeah, which for better or worse, because I mean he then immediately turns around and makes movies like Hang 'Em High and uh, Outlaw Josie Wales. Right, and and a lot of those movies they kind of feel samey, like they like they're trying to do this the uh, Dollars trilogy again. Like <laughs> I, I yeah I haven't found one of them I like as much as I like the Dollars movies. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things where everyone builds up Outlaw Josie Wales and then Pale Rider, and I'm like, you go back and watch them, and they're like, oh, well, no, man, that's not, that's, that's, there's, it's no fistful of dollars. No, and for me, Pale Rider, uh, looking back on it knowing, and, and seeing a little bit, knowing a little bit more now, it, it's such a direct ripoff of Shane. And even the end of the movie, Preacher, Preacher, well, that's a direct ripoff, Shane, Shane, sorry. Uh, and that, 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 that's what he did, and so yeah, he was he continued to make the, to, to make westerns, and as we know from Argo, if there's a horse in it, it's a western, and so uh, definitely that was there. And what was striking four Academy Awards, Best Picture, uh, Best Supporting Actor, I believe there was an editing uh, piece that got in there too, and Eastwood was also nominated for Best Actor, but uh, Al Pacino uh, did Scent of a Woman that year, and, and he got his, uh, I believe, first Oscar. Uh, for for that role, hoo ha, which uh, is one of those things that's like it's like the Academy. Well, it was okay, and we should have given him you one before, so you get it. And I I, I just think that Eastwood was so much so much better in uh, in this movie. I'm, not, I'm not, just not a fan of Son of a Woman. Eastwood didn't get his director best director Oscar until the Grand Torino, I think. So okay, and yes, but. Uh, you know, certainly versus we're having this conversation in the midst of uh, uh, Eastwood getting ready and, and coming out with his latest. And so uh, very appropriate to, to think about that and to, uh, uh, you know, contemplate that, you know, here he is in his 80s. Yeah. To be that vital, to be that on in terms of his, uh, you know, continuing to direct, continuing to do... And even a couple of years ago, uh, you know, doing the mule as an actor and still having the ability uh, to do that, just just remarkable. Holy smokes, that movie is so good. <laughs> yes, and what makes that fun is the fact that uh, Eastwood is prepared to uh, to embrace individuals that aren't traditional heroes, and that certainly is the case here. And, uh, and, you know, what, what's fascinating is that uh, between the Eastwood character and uh, the Gene Hackman character, it's like, boy, we really don't like Gene Hackman because he just does horrible things to, um, oh, good grief, I can't think of his name, the Englishman. Yeah. English Bob, uh, Richard Harris, in that film, I mean, just Beats him to a pulp because essentially English Bob was coming to kill those uh, kill those cowboys, and Hackman knew it and made a point and was like, "Tell your friends." <laughs> and you know, all the while, so it sets up Hackman as this uh, someone that you just don't like, and that at Eastwood we don't know what to think about as the movie goes on. And we learn, and we know, and we clearly see that he uh, he had some he had quite a past himself, and that past uh, uh, allowed him to do what he did. And by the end of the film, he's he's basically the bad guy by the end of the film, and then yes, and then it just kind of has a fascinating fade where there's no consequences for anything. Oh yeah, the only, you have really the only consequences. Uh, poor, poor Morgan Freeman. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he's he's the one that uh, essentially faced the consequences from uh, from what took place, and uh, you know that town was was pretty lawless as it was, and again, 
<laughs> the the moment where he dispatches uh, and, and addresses Gene Hackman, so to speak, and then yells out at the town, <laughs> I'm a terrorist. <laughs> I'm coming. If anybody comes after me, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after your wife. I'm coming after your kids. And he's pretty, pretty much left him alone. That's okay. Okay, well, you have a nice ride back to where you're going. Go it's, fasc it's fascinating this movie was the death of the Western. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, it's kind of fascinating that, we, that it's all about just the unveiling of no. such an awful character, and I, that, that coincided with the death of the entire genre. So, Well, I think Quick and the Dead had more to do with it, but that, that, that's just me. Are you telling me that Heaven's Gate didn't have anything to do with it? <laughs> it had horses. Well, I guess it's a Western. That's all the time we have for this segment. Join us for the next segment. We'll be discussing Ford v. Ferrari. Stay tuned. Hello, welcome back. So tell, what you, so tell us what you think about Ford v. Ferrari. Absolutely, it was one of the best movies I've seen in a while. I really, I walked out of the film, I really liked it, I thought it was uh, well done, I thought it was, uh, even though it's well over two hours, the runtime escapes me at the moment, but I know it was, it was probably closer to two and a half than two, did not feel the, the pacing was bad, I thought uh, the story was fun, I, you know, Christian Bale was fun. And Matt Damon, uh, his character was, uh, shall we say, sanitized a little bit for the purposes, so one of those based on a true story. So Christian Bale was, was really painted as uh, the difficult one in this, uh, his character, the driver's character, but it was truly Matt Damon <laughs> who in, in real life went through, I believe, at least six marriages and was on the way to a seventh divorce when he passed away. So he, he lost the race to divorce his wife to death. So exactly. Uh, so it was one of the races that uh, that he did he did not lose, or that he did lose, I should say. Uh, which which is the fun part here, and uh, you know to see this movie is as dark as marriage story. <laughs> not that dark. Um, so you know, for, for this film, you know, just really taking taking back and trying putting in a specific specific time and place. Uh, you know, some of the criticisms that I saw about the film uh, was that uh, Christian Bale's uh, wife was really the only woman that was involved and, and had any type of significant screen time in the film. But it was very much a guys movie. It's yeah, about guys working with guys driving in cars. And it was very much a 50s, 60s uh, feel to it. Obviously, these events happened in the 60s, but it started with uh, Matt Damon's character winning uh, the, uh, the 24 Hours at Le Mans, France, back in the, uh, the 1950s, and just uh, it takes it from there. So what, what, where are you coming at? I mean, I don't immediately graft on to cars as a concept, so mm -hmm. this, it, that kind of wasn't what I was interested in, but the story itself was fine. I, I wouldn't say I got as much out of it as a lot of people seem to, but everyone I've talked to seems to be absolutely adoring this movie. So so what did you not like? Uh, it wasn't a matter of not liking it. I mean, I just I think I was just kind of left somewhat cold by it. Mangold, is, 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 he's an exceptional director. Yeah. But occasionally, I walk away from his movies feeling a little bit cold. Like there's, they're they're always engaging and there's always interesting and there's always stuff to rewatch in them. Yeah. But I I remember I kind of felt had the same feeling with Logan, where this is an absolutely amazing movie where there's depth and amazing mm -hmm. character performances and everything's essentially as good as you could possibly make it. Yeah. And you just and there's but there's still a little bit of cold distance to it. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's it's a guy movie. Maybe that's appropriate. Yeah. So, don't talk about your feelings. We have. We have yes, to do. The one moment where actually there there are there is that moment it was it was rather remarkable was uh, the, the the character actor that played Henry Ford the second. Oh, he's good. He's and, very good. And he's been he's given a test drive in the vehicle that essentially he's paid for, paid a lot for. <laughs> 
that freaking scene? And, and Matt Damon drives him around the test track and jostles him and moves him in ways that he hasn't been jostled and hasn't moved in many, shall we say, a long time. And at the end, you can just tell that the, the poor guy was just white knuckling it through that experience. And he just started crying. And it's like, you, you thought that he had been so, so frightened. But it wasn't that. He was thinking about his father. And essentially, you know, here we are. You know, 50 years ago, my dad's making these tiny uh, models, uh, Model T's, and, you know, they barely barely went anywhere. They barely had any speed, and now, now we're doing this. And he just, I just thought it was an amazing, touching moment. Well-earned manly tears. Mm-hmm. Exactly. They're tears over legacy, the most manly of tears. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think the most interesting thing about to me was just kind of the implied ideas of the story about these two people that are kind of struggling to work within the bounds of the system. Yeah. Like someone pointed out in, on Twitter, this movie is essentially the opposite of uh, the Machowski's Speed Racer movie, which is a racing movie about a, a person that doesn't want to submit to a corporation, so they produce a car on their own terms and then be mm -hmm. beat the corporation. Right. Whereas this is a movie about trying to convince the corporation to let you work within their bounds and prove and make them look good. Yeah. So it's it's about the internal wrestling of of a. Uh, Authorial intent versus yeah. corporate needs, and that, that that ends up playing right up to the end where they were. I mean, I don't want to say what happens at the end because I mean, it's because it's kind of it's sad and happy at the same time because every character basically gets what they want, mm -hmm. but they don't get it in the way the way they want it. So, right. uh, yes, and and so it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, the good news, and, and you know, this is history, and that's it's, it's pretty straightforward. But uh, yeah, when, if, you, if you know any, I didn't know anything about the actual people involved, right. so I didn't know right. who what, what ended up happening to them after all this went down. So. Right. So we, we obviously the end of the movie uh, lets us know what happens to Christian Bale, but uh, I, I was doing some research as far as the uh, uh, the other character. <laughs> Sorry, we we have uh, uh, fresh wood today, and it's probably causing much. Much consternation. So, uh, but he's not a Logan fan, right? The fire isn't a. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, uh, with the fascinating piece was that Ford versus Ferrari was the same type of, uh, shall we say, piece that was going on within the team that was creating the car for Ford. Ferrari was handmade cars, very expensive, but. Uh, you know, incredibly well made, incredibly well put together. Whereas, uh, as I said, we do more cars in a day than Ferrari makes in a year. Well, they knew how to make lots of cars, but they needed to, they needed that specialty of that racing team to be able to do so and to be able to do that uh, on just a, a handful of vehicles. And based upon that, it was really that internal struggle. How how do you of uh, mass production versus artistry, and Ferrari had had that worked out, and Ford and uh, had, had to figure it out on his own with his group. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm. It's fascinating to know that that these people actually existed because it's not the story I was obviously aware of. Right. Isn't there like a documentary of this on Netflix too? Yes. What was that and called? I, I. I think it might have actually very similar to the name of this uh, to this film, but uh, uh, it, it or it might have been in the name of uh, the and I can't think of the racing team's name and uh, might have been uh, might have been that. Yeah. But I did watch it and picked up a little bit on on in terms of the background as well. I'd never heard of Le Mans before. That race sounds. Oh yes, um, in the nineteen fifties. Uh, there was a horrific accident that took place at Le Mans. And so the idea here, and we probably should talk really briefly about that, is it's twenty four. Uh, it's a 24-hour race. Whoever you know does the most laps in those 24 hours, and you can switch off. So you have multiple drivers for your team, each taking turns driving. And so uh, it, it, it 
it's 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 an endurance race, endurance for the drivers, endurance for the car, uh, and you know how do you make that car go, you know, 100, 200 miles an hour and be able to do so for an entire day. So that's the difficulty. But in the 1950s, uh, one of the German automakers, and I'm thinking it was Porsche. One of their cars uh, that had an accident, and the car crashed into the stands, and just it was it, it was like uh, uh, you know uh, you know just I believe fifty people were killed, fifty spectators were killed that day, and it was basically uh, Porsche uh, said we will never race again. They just gave it up. We're, we're simply not going to do it. And I believe to this day they still haven't, although, again, I'm not, not that close of a fan, but it was just, uh, um, that, that race has, has some really bad traditions to it. So, so it's specifically a maker's race. It's not like, in a, like private car people. It's just, it's, this is the, all the creators of the motor companies. Typically, yes. I mean, in, in the case here, you know, we talked, you know, they paid Ford to do that, but you, you, you pretty much got it. All right, that's all the time we have for this discussion. Join us for the following discussion where we'll be getting this week's movie recommendation. Hello, welcome to the show. Now we're moving on to the final segment where we'll be getting this week's movie recommendation. So, since we don't have the table like we normally do, I'll have to do the Carol Merrill or Vanna. Uh, my movie today is... Uh, I believe 1979, 1980, Peter Sellers film, Being There. Peter Sellers is the actor. He won his only Academy Award as Best Actor in this motion picture. It is one of the sweetest, one of the funniest movies that you're ever going to want to watch. Uh, Shirley MacLaine is in this film. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, uh, just wonderful character actors that are in it as well. But uh, what I wanted to do just very quickly is uh, Jack Warden also. Uh, Jack Warden plays the uh, President of the United States. So the movie surrounds Peter Sellers. He is a gardener. And he has been tending to uh, this, this property for a rich gentleman in New York City for years and years and years. And uh, the gentleman dies. He passes away. Well, the, the problem is he's done nothing else in his life. That, that gentleman that passed away has basically supported him and nurtured him and just sheltered him in that property all these, all these you know, four decades, 50 years, okay, or more. And so suddenly he dies. There's no family that basically uh, kicked him out. You can't stay here anymore. We're selling the house. And so... He's wandering the streets in New York with no place to go, no money, and suddenly he starts experiencing things that people, and again, this is, this is you know, think about Joker, New York of the 1970s. <laughs> That's suddenly a very naive man gets, uh, older man gets thrown out into New York City and is having to make his way in that Bad things happen. And Mr. But, Rogers, taxi driver. Yes. Are you talking to me? If, if, Are you talking to me there, son? If, <laughs> if Gregory Pack had played the role, and, and, <laughs> you know, which is my favorite SCTV, or if Woody Allen had played. But again, we're getting... Are you we're, talking we're, to me? <laughs> exactly. But he ends up finding another essentially rich patron in the hospital, and they take him in, and he, he, Peter Sellers is plays a really, really stupid person. I mean, he's dumb. But people think when he says that there's a great meaning in this, and everyone just uh, uh, he meets the president of the United States, and. He has a conversation because he's, he visits that rich man's home where he's at. And they have a conversation, and he, he uses a gardening metaphor. Talk, he talks about gardening when the president's asking him about the economy. And 
That's because that's all he knows. He knows gardening. He knows TV. He loves TV. I like to watch, which becomes very important later on. But again, this is a family show, and we don't want to talk about that. Gosh. Um, and uh, the President of the United States uses that gardening metaphor to talk about the economy. And it's, it becomes off as, as very, uh, you know, very knowledgeable. It comes off as uh, effort. And the movie ends with the idea that Peter Sellers is being, is, it could very well be, become President of the United States because the political parties are fighting over uh, him and wanting to be there. And so, you know, the way you see this is the way he's walking, and it's just, uh, I won't, won't go further than that, because it's such, it's such an amazing final moment in the film. And uh, the obliviousness, the wonderfulness, it's, it's all there, and I, I just can't recommend it enough. Again, this is my Criterion Collection version. I saw this, uh, this, this past year and uh, realized I, 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 I really, really wanted it. Meet John Doe meets Ferris Bu- uh, Forrest Gump, so a little bit Ferris of that. Bueller's yeah. Day Off. I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. There is a little of uh, definitely a little of that in there. But uh, again, Peter, he's really, really dumb. But it's uh, that makes it all the more wonderful, uh, and especially seeing the outtakes at the end are hysterical. All right, that's all the time we have for this episode of the show. If you want to find more past recordings of the show, you can do so on the Group Thing Productions YouTube page. You can follow me on Twitter at AntisocialCritEye. That's critic without the C at the end of it. And you can find my written reviews at Geeks Under Grace. I'm Tyler with the Fox Valley Film Critics. Have a wonderful day.